Here I show you the F statistic that used to test whether the multiple R or the R square is significantly different from zero. There's no need for you to do any uh, hand calculation because the F observed is given right here. In our case, it's a 46.63. If the null hypothesis were true, that means if the model explained no um, significant amount of variance in salary, the chance for you to observe this strong F value is lower than 0 0.001. So we're going to reject the null hypothesis. The, this is good news. That means this regression model is useful, explained a significant amount of variance in the dependent variable. Now, before we check the significance of the individual independent variables, I want to make it clear how this R score is related to this multiple correlation R and how it's different from the adjusted R score. Uh, this R score is a squared value of this multiple R. How do we get the multiple R? Remember, in multiple regression, the um, predicted y values are the end product of the linear combination of all the independent variables. So this multiple r is the linear correlation between the predicted y values and the observed y values. And why do we need to have this adjusted r score? That's because when you have too many independent variables in your model, the model R score can be uh, spuriously large. So the uh, adjusted R score is provided, uh, which take into consideration the number of predictor variables you have in your model in relation to the total sample size. All right, let's get back on track. We already found out that our, the model R score is statistically significant. The next thing we want to see is which independent variable contributes significantly to the model. So this is the coefficient table in which we can find out the test of the independent variables individually. And remember, we are going to use the unstandardized regression coefficient. This value divided by its uh, standard error that lead us to the t statistic. And we compare the p values with alpha equals 0.01 in our case to decide which variable contribute to the prediction of salary significantly. You can see that for highest degree type, we have a p that's lower than 0.001. And for years teaching in higher education institution, we have p-value that's very close, 0 0.001. And for gender, we have a p-value that's lower than 0 0.01 as well. The only variable that does not contribute significantly to the prediction of salary when other variables are already in the model is years on current job. Okay, because it has a p-value of 0 0.015 greater than r alpha equals 0 0.01. So this tells us three out of the four independent variables contribute significantly to the prediction of faculty salary when the other variables are already in the model. However, keep in mind that if you want to find out which of the independent variables impact the uh, faculty salary stronger than the others, you cannot look at the unstandardized regression coefficients because those values are scale dependent. So you want to look at the standardized regression coefficient. Uh, look at which variable has the uh, highest absolute value. In our case, highest degree type has a beta that equals 0 0.300, which is higher than all other independent variables. This indicates that highest degree type have the strongest impact on faculty salary. And the next one is uh, years uh, teaching in higher education institution, the measure of experience, so on and so forth. 
Um, it is also important for you to know how to interpret the values of the unstandardized and standardized regression coefficients. For unstandardized coefficient, the regression coefficient value indicates uh, for one unit increase in the, a particular independent variable, the value you see is the predicted change in the dependent variable holding other variables in the model constant. For example, uh, years teaching in higher education institution, the regression coefficient is 0.342. So one year increase in this value will lead to a predicted increase in faculty salary by 0.432 thousand dollars. In other words, one year increase in teaching experience lead to a predicted salary increase of $432 holding other variables constant. How about gender? Gender has only two values, male, female, and the unstandard regression coefficient is negative 5.117. In our data file, for gender, one is uh, for male, two is for female. Okay, so we can see that for gender, when it changed from one to two, the increase from um, change from male to female, the predicted salary decreased by $5,117 on average. And this gap existed when the measures of education, background, experience, and seniority are already taken into consideration in this model. And the interpretation of the standardized regression coefficient uh, are uh, done in a very similar manner, except for the change of the unit to standard deviations. So for example, um, one standard deviation increase in years on current job uh, is lead to about 0.152 standard deviation increase in faculty salary holding other variables constant. Uh, just be aware that for dichotomous variables such as gender, the interpretation of standardized regression coefficient doesn't really make sense. If you would like to uh, report your regression equation as the result you have right here, you will see the y hat, the predict y value equals 2.746 plus 8.78 times x1 plus 0 0.432 times x2 plus 0 0.336 times x3 minus 5.117 times x4, and you know x1, 2, 3, 4 represents those uh, four independent variables. In multiple regression analysis, we also want to make sure that we do not have the problem of multicollinear narrative. Um, how do we uh, identify whether we have that problem or not? We come to this place called VIF, variance inflation factor, and we want to make sure all the values here are below 10. Uh, that's the uh, guideline for making a judgment. If you have the VIF values all below 10, you can make a claim that I do not have a problem of multicollinearity in my uh, regression model. So what would you do if you did have a problem of multicollinear narrative? Um, just for um, example, just imagine we had uh, two measures. One is years on teaching um, experience, the other one is years on current job. If those two are highly correlated and they cause a problem with multicollinear narrative, what you can do is drop one of them. That's one way to do it. Or if you find out, okay, both measures have the same 
uh, scale, they are both measured on the number of years. Maybe I can just take an average of the two, combine them into one variable, and enter that combined variable into the regression model um, to avoid the problem of multicollinear narrative, um, which, if you remember, is uh, caused by the uh, very high or very strong correlation among the independent variables. Now, before you finalize your analysis, finalize your regression model, you want to make sure you meet the underlying assumptions. We already checked the linearity with the scatter plots. Now, let's move on to the uh, normal probability plot and other chart we uh, requested. In this um, histogram, the residuals was plotted. And if we meet the assumption for normality, you can see that your distribution of residual should have been following this distribution of normal curve. Uh, in our case, uh, we don't really follow that curve. We have a very high um, distribution of um, residuals somewhere below one, below zero. And this is another way to check normality, the normal probability plot. And if you meet the assumption of uh, normality, all the um, residuals, they should uh, right be here along the diagonal line. And here, again, we're a little bit off the diagonal line. So we uh, don't really meet assumption of normality in this model. Um, but the counter argument here can make is that um, the violation of normality is no big deal if you have large sample size. Since we have more than 500 in our sample, we can see, you know, um, the violation of normality in our case have um, minimal consequences. The large chart we have here is the chart for us to examine whether we meet the uh, assumption of um, homocysticity. And if we do, if we do meet the assumption, this is what you expect to see. You imagine you have a line that goes through the residual equals zero, and all the residual points should be scattered randomly along that line that goes through zero. Um, you should have no specific patterns other than that you have a little bit more uh, scatter point uh, along around the zero line, and as you go further, you have fewer points. But here, we seem to have a horn pattern in our distribution. So um, this is indication we actually do not meet the assumption of homostasticity. In this particular example, the problem we have with uh, normality and uh, homostasticity is caused uh, primarily by the non-normal distribution, the very skewed distribution of faculty salary, which can be fixed statistically. As a matter of fact, in most economic studies about salary, uh, the income or the salary uh, is transformed by taking a natural log, which improves the linearity, normality, and homostasticity of the distribution altogether. But it's beyond the scope of our discussion in this class. Uh, we'll stop right here. Thank you.